That is not work. Okay. Is Of quantum information and quantum gravity. Um, I'm not sure if he's happy for me to put it that way because he's done a lot of important work in computer science uh, in his own right. Um, but the way that I learned that I should have been studying quantum information much more, um, the first warning shot was a paper by Patrick in 2007 with John Preskill, where he analyzed the black hole information paradox in an entirely new language that we have missed. And he discovered a fascinating effect that I hope mirror information, if it comes out at all, um, which we have missed. Um, and, and so it, it became clear that this is the language that we're going to have to learn to do quantum gravity, just as it has become clear that we have to learn many techniques from finance matter. But really, Patrick has been at the forefront of creating what I think is, is, is the future, the new field which, which transcends these whole boundaries between these three fields that people in my generation grew up in. Um, Patrick was, um, oh, and I should say that the black hole firewall paradox that you guys may have heard about is another example and maybe the latest and most dramatic example of applying that kind of reasoning um, to the problem of, of black holes and quantum gravity. Uh, so really, it's at the center of how we work now. Uh, Patrick was a Rhodes Scholar, a uh, Sloan Fellow. He did an undergraduate at McGill. His uh, graduate studies uh, at Oxford. A postdoc at Caltech, and uh, then became a professor at McGill until Stanford, uh, so only in 2013. And so we are now lucky to have him relatively close. And I look forward to his talk next session. Well, thank you, Raphael, for the very kind introduction and for uh, the invitation to speak here. It's a pleasure and an honor. And as Raphael pointed out, um, my background actually at McGill, I was a professor in the computer science department. Uh, and so while I have you know, some kind of background in physics, um, I was approaching the kinds of questions, uh, you know, or the, say the black hole information paradox question, uh, from a very different perspective. And definitely from the perspective of an outsider, and I think I'm still I still consider myself an outsider. Um, and most of my work, ah. <laughs> all right. So most of my work has been about quantum error correcting codes, finding you know, ways to protect uh, the future quantum computers that we hope to build against uh, the noise that they're going to have to suffer or ways to communicate through quantum media, you know, the optimal way to communicate over optical fiber, taking advantage of all kinds, all the quantum mechanical effects. Uh, but it turns out that those kinds of questions uh, have a surprising overlap uh, with the problems of quantum gravity. And in the next uh, 50 minutes or so, I would like to give you a bit of an idiosyncratic tour of some of the most recent ways that those ideas from quantum information have manifested themselves uh, in the study of quantum gravity. And I don't think that quantum information is the magic bullet that is going to allow us to finally solve all of these deep, uh, these deep problems. But I think it is clear that it is providing a new language and a new way of seeing things. And some problems that were previously difficult or some questions that were hard to understand and this, from this new perspective are natural. Uh, and they give us a, it gives us a uh, very new and powerful perspective. Uh, so a good place to start, not the beginning of the story, but when I was asked to start somewhere, uh, is the holographic principle. First formulated by uh, Gerard de Hooft and Lenny Susskind, and I'm sure many of you or all of you have heard of it before. Uh, but it's the idea that all the information in a given region of space is somehow encoded on the boundary of that region. And on the face of it, this sounds like a completely crazy idea. Because we could just think of a crystal, for example, uh, in which we have a bunch of atoms arrayed uh, in three dimensions in a regular fashion like this. Uh, and it takes at least one bit of information to specify the state of each atom. And so the amount of information that you can store in the crystal is proportional to the number of atoms, which is proportional to the volume. And so in general, the amount of volume you can squeeze into a region of space uh, should be proportional to its volume, not its surface area. Of course, uh, Susskind and Tehuft had reasons for making this proposal. It's not as crazy as it sounds. And the reason is that uh, if you try to pack too much stuff into a given volume of space, that stuff is going to collapse to a black hole. And as Beckestein and Hawking taught us, the 
entropy of a black hole is proportional not to its volume, uh, but to area. And the entropy measures the number of different uh, microstates of the black hole, presumably, uh, given uh, some macroscopic parameters, and therefore the number of different states uh, or amount of information you can store in it. And of course, and since I'm at, at Berkeley, it's important to point out uh, that the proper covariant formulation of this holographic principle, uh, which is still a conjecture, but Raphael and friends are making progress on it even recently, uh, was formulated by Raphael Busu back in 1999. So, uh, to Hooft and Susskind made this proposal uh, in the mid-1990s, like 1994, um, and surprisingly soon after that, uh, this crazy idea was given concrete, uh, mathematically precise uh, realization uh, in Maldacena's conjectured ADS-CFT correspondence, anti disseter space conformal field theory. So this is again something most or all of you have probably heard before, but it's always, uh, hopefully there are some undergraduates in the audience or people who have seen this, or perhaps you, know, you might appreciate an information theorist's uh, perspective on these things. I'll just uh, review the story. The idea is that two uh, theories, uh, two physical theories, are supposed to be isomorphic, right? They're supposed to have isomorphic Hilbert spaces. Uh, there should be a one to a bijective map between observables in one theory to observables in the other theory. States on one theory should map to states in the other theory. They should be the same thing. Uh, however, those two theories, on the face of it, describe completely different physical situations. So the first theory is supposed to be a theory of quantum gravity uh, in d plus one dimensions, d spatial dimensions, say one time. Uh, and so they're going to be, it's going to be a string theory or something like that. Uh, and it's string theory in what is, or it's quantum gravity uh, in what is known as asymptotically anti disitter space. So again, you're all physicists. Uh, you're all well aware that often physics problems are made simpler by trying to put everything inside a box. Uh, it's something, you know, that, that eliminates some of the infinities or uncontrolled quantities. And so anti disitter space is like a fancy box uh, for uh, quantum gravity itself. Uh, and so this is a negatively curved space uh, that has a time-like boundary. And so it really is like a space-time uh, in a soup can, like I've drawn here. Um, and uh, which, well, I'll, we'll say more about the structure of, uh, uh, of ADS space in a moment. Um, but an important, uh, yes, so that's, uh, that's the uh, d plus one dimensional quantum gravity theory. It's supposed to be exactly equivalent to uh, another theory living in one fewer spatial dimensions uh, that is defined on the boundary of ADS space. So the ADS is a, uh, a space-time with a boundary. Uh, and uh, in this case, where there's uh, two spatial dimensions in ADS and one time dimension, the boundary is just a ring plus time, or cross time. Uh, and you can just think of the theory living there as being some moderately exotic material. There's no gravity, right? And so it's just described by a quantum field theory, and in fact, a conformal field theory. So it's a, uh, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a quantum field theory with particular scaling symmetry, which you can think of as uh, that the parameters of the theory are tuned such that it, the, uh, the system is existing exactly at a quantum phase transition. So these things are supposed to be exactly equivalent. Um, but they look very different, obviously. In particular, the bulk theory, the ADS theory, uh, it has gravity in it, and it has an extra spatial dimension. So from the point of view of this boundary CFT, there's one dimension of space that emerges out of nothing, right? And so one of the ongoing mysteries and questions that one wants to understand uh, in this ABS CFT correspondence is where that extra direct direction of space comes from. How, do we, how does it actually emerge from the boundary theory? Uh, another on, you know, uh, set of questions one wants to know the answer to is what is the relationship between physical quantities deep inside the bulk, right? If I wanted to ask the question, uh, you know, I, I put some matter, maybe some black holes, some stars, what does an, uh, an observer uh, in the bulk experience? Um, how, do, how can I answer that question entirely in terms of boundary quantities? That is sort of, again, an ongoing mystery on which there is a great deal of work, but there's still questions to be answered. Uh, and so in this talk, I'm gonna try to give you some perspective on both of those questions and how uh, quantum information at least is make, helping us to make some progress on them. Uh, all right, so a little bit more about anti de Sitter space. Uh, if we take spatial slices of anti de Sitter, uh, then we actually get hyperbolic space. And here is one of Escher's renderings of hyperbolic space. Uh, the way that you measure distances uh, is using the fish counting metric. So the distance between any two points, maybe I'll go here, 
uh, say, between this point and that point, is the minimal number of fish that you had to point through, uh, go through to go from point A to point B. Uh, so in, this, in, in that example, I think we were talking about four fish worth of distance. Um, oops. Now, as you can see, the fish get smaller and smaller as you get out towards the boundary. Uh, in fact, there's an infinite distance uh, between any point in the bulk deep inside and the boundary. Uh, now, it's a negatively curved space. Triangles, or the angles in a triangle add up to less than 180 degrees. Um, and in the theory, we're allowed, uh, we want the theory not to, to or the, the system not to just, or not to be exactly anti de Sitter space. It just has to asymptotically become anti de Sitter as you go out towards the boundary. And so one is allowed to put matter deep inside, like a black hole. And if you do that, then the geodesics that were these you know, single colored fish uh, in the original Escher uh, rendering get deformed, something like this. Um, and I suppose it might be worth mentioning uh, that because time is curved also, if I take a laser pointer and I'm deep inside anti de Sitter space and I point it out of the boundary, uh, even though the boundary is an infinite distance away, uh, I pose reflecting boundary conditions, the light will bounce back and come back to me uh, in a finite amount of time. All right, so what are we going to do over the next 50 minutes? Uh, we're starting with the ADS-CFT starter kit, of which you already have the essential pieces. Uh, and in the story that we're going to tell, this is about information and quantum mechanics and quantum gravity, entropy is going to play a starring role. So we're going to talk about entropy in quantum mechanics and then entropy in this ADS-CFT co correspondence. And that's going to take us to a constellation of ideas that you wouldn't think are very closely related. Uh, so those ideas are some of the ansatzes that are used to describe, uh, to do numerical work in condensed matter theory, uh, the kinds of techniques that you would use to, uh, to establish entanglement over long distances, um, and the holographic correspondence that I've just described. Um, so that's going to be sort of part one, one of the unexpected, interesting connections between quantum gravity and quantum information. And then part two, we're going to come back to this ADS-CFT course, or we'll, we'll always be in the ADS-CFT correspondence, but this question of the relationship between bulk observables and boundary observables. And it turns out that there's some ambiguity in that story, which was quite puzzling, uh, and the solution to that ambiguity, at really understanding what was going on, uh, comes from another part of quantum information theory, quantum error correction. Uh, the techniques used to build fault-tolerant quantum computers. So again, one wouldn't have thought these things were related, but they actually are. So let's start with the, the question of entropy in quantum mechanics. So here I have two atoms. Uh, I'll just label one state the ground state zero, another one the ex an excited state one, and I have an A atom and a B atom. And I have, I'm going to prepare a state of the two atoms, uh, which is zero for A, one for B, uh, superposition one for A, zero for B. Right? And I've depicted the yellow configure or the left-hand configuration in yellow, so I have a ground state, excited state, and superposition with an excited state, ground state. Uh, so very familiar stuff. Um, if we were to measure the, fir uh, the first atom, uh, what happens? Well, half the time I get the ground state, half the time I get the excited state, right? Uh, no mystery. If I measure both atoms, well, what do I find? Well, they're correlated, right? So half the time I get ground state excited, the other half of the time I get excited ground. And the other two possibilities, ground, ground, excited, excited, don't occur. Um, now, that actually implicitly assumes that I performed a particular type of measurement. As you all well know, in quantum mechanics, uh, there are many different observables, and different observables aren't necessarily compatible with each other. So I could have chosen to measure in a different basis. Right? There's some procedure that would allow me to do this. Uh, so in particular, I could have measured this basis ground, ground, plus excited, excited, zero, ground, ground, minus excited, excited, uh, and so on and so forth. And if I use that basis, then what I find uh, is precisely that the state is ground, excited, plus excited, ground, right? That that is the state that I prepared, and so if I measure in that basis, that's exactly what I find happened. Um, and so rather than getting a stochastic outcome, I get a precise, well-defined outcome. Again, all things that you know very well. Um, but since I now have probability distributions associated to, uh, to different measurements, I can assign an entropy, which measures the uncertainty of a given measurement. And I've called this the Shannon entropy, minus the sum of probability log probability over the different outcomes. Uh, but of course, this is really the, the Gibbs entropy of statistical mechanics. It predates Shannon. Um, and of course, in the case of the first measurement, there were two equally likely possibilities. That's one bit of uncertainty. Likewise, for the second measurement, in the third measurement, there's no uncertainty. It's, I always get the same outcome in the measurement, zero bits of uncertainty. 
So the way you define entropy in quantum mechanics, and this is due to von Neumann back in 1929, uh, he didn't phrase it this way, but this is equivalent, that you think of all the different measurements that you could perform on a given system, all the different bases that you could use to measure it, and then you choose the one that gives the least or the most certain outcome, the least entropic outcome. Right? So you minimize the entropy over all choices of the basis, and that is the proper definition of, an, uh, of entropy in quantum mechanics. There's a simpler formula than this. If you know density operators, it's minus the trace of rho log rho, but I think this is a, a nice operational way of talking about it. And so in particular, uh, for, the a system, for the A atom alone, it turns out that whatever measurement basis I choose, I'm always going to get two equally likely outcomes. And so the entropy is one bit. But as we've seen in this little calculation, if I choose to measure the AB system in this entangled basis, uh, then I get no uncertainty at all. So the pr proper uh, entropy to assign to the joint system is zero bits. And this means that the entropy of the whole is less than the entropy of the individual parts, right? And this may not surprise you very much, but you should stop, you know? yeah? This is a, a simple observation, but it's a very important observation. It's something, I think, quite profound and interesting about quantum mechanics. Uh, because here we're talking about probabilities and entropies and systems, so you might think, well, this is a lot like just probability distributions and entropies. Uh, so I could uh, think about a joint random variable. Is it going to be sunny or rainy tomorrow uh, in Berkeley? There's variable x. And then variable y might be, uh, I don't know, are the Republicans or the Democrats going to win the election uh, in November? So, so there are my x and y variables. And I'm, I am more uncertain about x and y together, which is the outcome of both of those events, than I am about x and y individually. That just stands to reason, right? Um, so the entropy of x and y together is larger than the entropy of x, and that's always true for probability distributions. This is not true for quantum states. The entropy of the whole is less than the entropy of the part. Uh, and that is a signature of the presence of quantum mechanical correlation, what we call entanglement. And in fact, uh, in the situation where the joint state has zero entropy, uh, the uncertainty of a piece uh, is really the proper way to quantify how much correlation there is between the two pieces, how much entanglement there is between A and B, is measured by the entropy of A alone. Uh, and so entropy in quantum mechanics, which is uncertainty, is in fact also a measure of entanglement. And that's an important message and one that you should, uh, you, you should, you should uh, take to heart. Um, all right, so entropy of a subsystem measures correlation of that subsystem with the rest of the universe. All right, so now let's move on to this holographic setting, uh, ABS-CFT, uh, and let's think about the entropy of a subsystem, right? Because this is the same thing, like I had two atoms and I wanted to talk about the entropy of the first atom. If I actually had a ring of this exotic material constituting the boundary of ADS space, uh, so I just have a ring of some of material here, I could look at a piece of the ring and I could ask, what is the proper entropy to associate to the piece of that ring? Uh, and now stop for a second. Again, it's always worth you know, pausing, you know, even the simple things, uh, and try to think, how would you do that calculation? Right? Maybe this is a spin chain, and this region A that I've cut off here constitutes, I don't know, 10 to the 23 spins. Uh, uh, and so you have some enormous quantum state, and you're supposed to look at some part of it and optimize over all possible measurements you could ever perform. Uh, and then calculate this funny sum of minus probability log probability, it sounds like a terrible, difficult calculation. Uh, and it is, although it is one that people have actually done, believe it or not. You know, phys you know, theoretical physicists are uh, gluttons for punishment. Um, however, uh, uh, if we remember that there's an alternative description of this conformal field theory uh, in terms of the, you know, the quantum gravity of anti de Sitter space, um, then there should be some way of expressing the entropy purely in terms of these quantum gravity quantities. Uh, and if you're in the semi-classical limit, uh, back in 2006, Ryu and Takianagi proposed a formula for what this quantum mechanical entropy would be uh, in terms of the bulk quantities. And that formula is a super simple thing. Right? Remember the complicated process that I was describing before, optimize overall measurements, 10 to 23 atoms, yada, yada, yada. Um, so the formula is I've set h bar and c equal to 1, so 1 over 4 times Newton co Newton's constants times the area of a minimal surface. So uh, 
In terms of the pictures that I'm going to draw today, I'm going to restrict to the case where the bulk is 2 plus 1 dimensional, so the boundary is just a ring. These statements generalize to higher dimensions, but uh, uh, it's just simpler to draw the pictures in this case. So in this particular case, if A is an interval on that, uh, on that boundary, what I'm supposed to do is I'm supposed to minimize over curves that start and end on the endpoints of A and penetrate into the bulk. And so I'm just, just supposed to find the, uh, the surface of minimal area, which in this context is actually the curve of minimal length. And as you all well know, the curve of minimal length is going to follow a geodesic, right? And so I've drawn that geodesic here. We just follow the fish. Uh, and the length of this curve is, in fact, the entropy of A. So this is an easy calculation, right? This is the kind of thing all of you have done in a classical mechanics class, right? Just a little calculus of variations problem. So that huge complicated thing in this context reduces to a very simple calculation. So this was a kind of a wonderful observation, although at the time it wasn't entirely clear what it meant. And the interest in this result has just been building steadily ever since then. Um, I'll skip that state. Well, uh, in more general circumstances, where A is perhaps not just an interval on the boundary, what you can observe uh, you could ask, well, what surfaces am I supposed to minimize over here? And you can observe that if I take A on the boundary, I take its union with gamma A, the geodesic, then I get uh, this uh, diamond-shaped thing that bounds a region inside the bulk. And so that's the definition of what it means for gamma A to be homologous to A, is that A and gamma A together are the boundary of something. So that's the, that's the general uh, definition. You optimize over gamma A homologous to A. Now, this uh, Ryu Takinagi proposal, one of the reasons it's, ex it's exciting is that it generalizes Hawking and Bekenstein's observation back in the 70s that black holes have entropy and that entropy is proportional to the area. Uh, if we put a black hole inside ADS space, uh, we could ask the question, what is the entropy of the whole boundary, right? Uh, and in this case, the, condi the homology condition causes uh, the, uh, the minimal surface to get hung up on the horizon of the black hole. And so the minimal surface, you know, the area of the minimal surface is the area of the horizon, and you recover the Bekenstein-Hawking formula. So Ryu and Takinagi taught us that not only do we assign entropy to black holes, but we can assign entropy to empty space using a similar prescription, uh, slightly more complicated. And the deep message uh, is about entanglement. Because as you saw on the previous slide, in quantum mechanics, entanglement and entropy uh, are very closely related quantities. In particular, entanglement, or the entanglement between a region and its complement uh, is measured by the entropy of that region. And so if I think about all of these entropies of all these different regions, uh, what they're telling me about is the entanglement structure of the boundary state. And so the entanglement structure of the boundary straight state reflects the geometry of the bulk, right? And in some cases, you, it even, it's even further than that, it, it, it completely encodes the geometry of the bulk. Uh, and so if you were asking the question, how does geometry, how does that radial direction emerge in the boundary, from, it, from the boundary theory in which it doesn't exist, uh, a big part of the answer to that question is that it emerges from the entanglement structure of the boundary state in this precise way. All right. So another uh, connected set of ideas that we're going to you know, uh, bring into the mix um, goes back to, well, 2007 and a little bit before, uh, and again, sort of had its origin in the quantum information community, um, but the objective was something completely different. Um, and it was, you know, something, let's say, a little bit more practical than thinking about quantum gravity. Uh, that you might have been, you know, people, you know, condensed matter theorists in particular, you know, very bright, uh, enterprising people, uh, we're interested in calculating the ground state properties and other, uh, and even say finite temperature properties, as you as you all are, uh, of um, well, uh, various physical systems, um, quantum mechanical systems, and the difficulty with doing this. Well, there are many difficulties, but one of the one of the main difficulties is that if this is quantum mechanics, so you just have a spin chain, uh, and you have n spins, and each one is a spin one half, then the total Hilbert space has dimension two times two times two times two n times, 2 to the n. So even at 100 spins, you have a Hilbert space that you could not encode using you know, all of the matter in the universe, right? Uh, and so this is a difficulty, right? The, naive, you know, the naive, naive thing that you would write down to try to simulate quantum mechanics or find ground states, you can't even write down the ground state. It's far too big ever to include in your computer. 
Uh, and so there are various ways around that. Um, but back in 2007, Guifre Vidal, also a quantum information theorist, we were both Cal uh, Caltech postdocs at the same time, he came up with an ansatz. I right? said, well, if we can't write down all of the states in Hilbert space, let's try to write down some family of states uh, which is capable of representing all of the physical states we encounter in nature, or say all the ground states of local Hamiltonians. Uh, and his idea, uh, remember, what is a quantum state? It's a list of coefficients, right, in some ket. So you have to figure out how to calculate those coefficients. And he said the way you calculate coefficients is something like multiplying a bunch of matrices, right? But you don't multiply matrices, you actually contract tensors. So you have not just, instead of two-dimensional matrices, you have, say, a three-dimensional tensor, just in the mathematical sense. It's not, so just a three-dimensional array of numbers or a four-dimensional array of numbers, like right, right there. And every time there's an edge in this graph, you contract the associated indices. And this is the way that you produce the list of numbers that is the, uh, the coefficients of the state. And his idea was that if the quantum state you're trying to represent has scaling symmetry, uh, that's the hard case, uh, so that you have long distance correlations, then you should use a network that itself has some kind of scaling symmetry, like I've drawn right here. Uh, and this turned out to be a very useful thing to do. Uh, that this, you know, there are now proofs that this type of network does properly actually capture uh, the ground states of real local Hamiltonians, uh, and it's even been used uh, to a significant degree for numerical work. Now, a few years later, Brian Swingle, uh, when he was a graduate student at MIT, he looked at this tensor network. It has a very big mouthful of a name, multi-scale entanglement renormalization ansatz. They shorten it to MIRA. So he looked at the MIRA tensor network, uh, and he observed that uh, if, if you try to calculate the distance between two points uh, on the boundary by asking what is the minimal number of edges that you have to pass through to get between those two points, what is the minimum cut in this graph, then you get pretty much the same answer as if you calculated the fish counting metric uh, in the Escher print. And in fact, both the Mira tensor network and the, uh, well, the, fit, the Escher fish uh, drawing are just discrete representations uh, or approximations of hyperbolic space. And so Brian's idea was that this tensor network, which arises naturally when we try to represent the state, actually uh, is a reflection uh, of, the, of, the under, or of the associated uh, geometry in ADS-CFT. Now, the precise way in which those things would be associated was kind of unclear, but just by looking at the pictures, uh, it seemed pro promising that something like that could be true. Uh, and in the past uh, little while, we've made a little bit of progress uh, on going further with that, uh, that relationship that I'll tell you about. Now, uh, what I'm going to do now is to just describe a kind of toy model uh, for aspects of the ADS-CFT correspondence. Uh, because one thing that I should emphasize is that the correspondence, there's a lot of evidence for it, uh, but it's conjectural. Right? There's no proof that left-hand side is equal to right-hand side. Uh, and so if we want to understand kind of really what's going on underneath the surface, uh, it would be great to have a, you know, something analogous to ADS-CFT where we can prove that left-hand side is equal to right-hand side. And so that's what I'm going to do right now, construct a kind of correspondence in which everything is controlled. Uh, and so we're going to represent the boundary state in some kind of toy ADS-CFT as the contraction of a network of random tensors. So here's the Mira tensor network I showed you on the previous slide. Uh, just for the purposes of illustration, that's a lot of tensors. Uh, I want to do something a little bit simpler. So I'm going to replace that by a simpler network. But just for the purposes of illustration, you should really think that if we want to represent a space-time, there are going to be lots of points, and the, the points are going to be a form of a fine, a fine mesh uh, in the bulk. So here I have a network, just a graph. It has some edges and some vertices. And I have two kinds of vertices. I have vertices that only touch one edge, like this one up here, this one, that one, that one. And then I have vertices that touch multiple edges. So the ones that only touch one edge, I'll call those boundary, right? And the ones that touch multiple edges, I'll call those bulk vertices, right? So those are gonna be the analog of the interior of ADS and the boundary theory. And I wanna define a class of quantum states. So how am I gonna do that? Well, I'm gonna take this network and I'm gonna pull it apart a little bit. And for each edge, uh, I'm going to have um, a, Hil a bipartite Hilbert space. So think of it as like there being like an atom for the one half of the edge, and an atom for the right hand, or for the other half of the edge. Uh, so 
there will be a Hilbert space d-dimensional by d-dimensional, d squared dimensional, and I'll have a quantum state associated with the edge, which is just maximally entangled um, between the two halves, a perfectly correlated superposition of the two halves. Uh, and then to each vertex, I will associate another quantum state, but I'm going to write, write it as a bra instead of as a ket. Okay? And so say the, the size of V1 is associated with the first vertex, and so it's a bra uh, associated with the three d-dimensional Hilbert spaces at the vertex. This one, this one, that one. So this is unfortunately the most technical slide uh, in the whole thing, but I just want to set up, set up the model. Right? Uh, and the quantum state that I want to associate with the boundary is just what I get when I multiply all of these bras by the associated kets. Right? Now, as you well know from quantum mechanics, if I take a bra and a ket and I put them together, I just get a number, right? I get an inner product. Uh, so if I take a bunch of bras and I take a bunch of kets, you think, well, I should just get a number, right? But observe that the bras only act on the bulk vertices, and it leaves some boundary vertices untouched. And so this prescription leaves me a quantum state, a ket, living only on the boundary. So it's a way of taking a bulk state, or a state that includes both bulk and boundary indices, and pushing it all out to the boundary. It's kind of like, a, as I said, sort of some toy picture starting point for thinking about ADS-CFT. And then the, the remaining question is, well, how do I choose uh, these vertex, uh, vertex bras? And for the purposes of this talk, uh, let's just say we'll choose them. We don't really know what they're supposed to be. Let's just choose them at random. And this is one of my specialties as a quantum information theorist. Uh, any of you have ever taken a course in information theory uh, know very well that you know, if you're trying to find some way to accomplish some complicated information theoretic communication task and you don't know how to do it, what you should do is just choose your procedure at random. And astonishingly frequently, choosing things at random, if you choose you know, the right random set, gives you uh, a result which is almost optimal. And that actually turns out to be the case here, that if we choose our vertex uh, projections at random, then the resulting quantum state we get on boundary is as entangled as it can possibly ever be uh, while being consistent with the original network structure. So if I choose a region A on the boundary and its complement B, you could ask, well, how much entanglement can we ever have between A and B? And if you look at the original network, well, there is one, uh, there, there's sort of a bottleneck in the network. And that bottleneck constrains the amount of entanglement we can have between the left and the right. But with random choices, we actually get uh, a state that has essentially that, that amount of entanglement. Uh, and so in general, uh, what, you, what you do if you choose these random tensors is that you get a boundary state uh, in which the amount of enta uh, entanglement between any region and its complement uh, is given by the minimum cut in the network. Right? So entropy is given by minimum cut. That's worth just going back to the previous slide. Remember that when we had the Mira network, what we saw was that the distance in hyperbolic space was approximated by the minimum cut. And so if you can construct a quantum state in which entropy is given by minimum cut, then you are actually properly reproducing the geometry of the bulk. And so this procedure, which seemed pretty brain dead, which was just to uh, start off with a bunch of bell pairs in the network, randomly project them, it produces a quantum state with exactly the right kind of uh, entanglement. Now, that's a starting point uh, for a larger set of questions uh, that we don't, you can use this idea not just to construct a state, but to construct some version of the holographic correspondence, a map between bulk and boundary. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but I just want to now uh, give you an indication of how the mathematics, what we were just talking about, uh, which is motivated and was used to analyze you know, some version of the ADS-CFT correspondence, some toy version, has, uh, makes an appearance in a completely different setting like a, a very technologically, practically oriented setting. And the question is, how could we send qubits over long distances, right? Um, so a qubit is just the, the state of a quantum system. And if you want to answer that question, uh, you should start off by asking the question, well, how could we send bits over long distances? It happens all the time, right? You can fire up your browser and look at some web page which is being hosted in Japan. There's no problem with that. And for the most part, those bits are carried around the world on fiber optic links. And so here I have the map of the undersea fiber optic links around planet Earth, the main ones that existed as of 2014. You can't see them very well, but I'm sure you can imagine them. Uh, but 
those links are not just links, right? If, we, if, I, if I laid an optical fiber from San Francisco at, you know, across the Pacific Ocean to Japan, uh, whoever was you know, looking at the other end of the fiber uh, would look into the fiber, photo detector, and they'd see nothing, right? The loss in the fiber would ultimately consume all of the light that you try to send through it. And so in practice, what happens is every 70 kilometers or so, uh, you have an amplifier. And what is an amplifier, at least conceptually? It's something that looks at the signal uh, and then sends out you know, another copy of the signal uh, of larger amplitude so that it, uh, it will survive to, to be read another day you know, further down the line. Uh, so that's great. You know, there's, of course, a huge amount of technology associated with doing this efficiently and well, but conceptually, it's straightforward. How do we send qubits over long distances? Uh, so there, there's a challenge. Right? I mean, you might just say, well, just build amplifiers, right? But what do I mean by sending a qubit? Uh, I could, for example, have the polarization of, the of a photon. Uh, and the photon is you know, passing, you know, passing by. It's hard, to, it's hard to keep photons stationary. Uh, but no one told me what the polarization is. And so if I wanted to amplify polarization, what could I do? I could try to measure polarization. But in measuring polarization, I force it to be, say, horizontal or vertical. And thereby, and if it happened to be a superposition of horizontal and vertical, I'll, I'll damage the polarization. So the idea of building an amplifier by measuring and then preparing another state fails. And in fact, uh, there's nothing you can do about that. Uh, but this, you know, one of the simplest, uh, most trivial results in quantum mechanics, known as the no cloning theorem, tells you that if you have a quantum system and you don't know what state it is, like let's say it's an atom, you don't know its electronic state, you could ask, can I in principle build a machine that takes in an atom in some electronic state and then outputs two atoms in the same electronic state as the original, or takes in a photon uh, in unknown polarization and outputs two photons in the same polarization as the original. That transformation is nonlinear. Quantum mechanics is a linear theory. It doesn't happen. It can't be built. And so amplifiers for quantum states don't exist. And so uh, you might have thought you know, that right now the, the um, the best technology that exists allows us to establish, you know, to, to, to send quantum states over roughly 120 kilometers or so, maybe 140. I don't know exactly what the record is right now. But it's not going to get much better than that. It's because, you know, there are losses in the atmosphere. Uh, and, um, and, there's, and it's impossible to amplify. However, and this is really quite a surprise, there are things that you can do. Uh, and the things that you can do uh, are, one, something called quantum repeaters that we'll talk about. Uh, and you can combine that with the idea of quantum error correction. That not, even though you can't amplify quantum information, there are ways to make it robust to certain kinds of noise. And both quantum repeaters and quantum error correction are going to play a role in what follows in different ways. So what is a quantum repeater? Uh, to start to, to, to tell that story, uh, we should just start with teleportation. And again, most of you are probably familiar with teleportation, but it's, uh, it's a, an old but good observation. So again, if I have some quantum information, you know, the state of some quantum system, I don't know what that system is, let's say it's a qubit, a two-dimensional quantum system, uh, and I want to send it uh, to my friend, uh, and my friend is you know, far away. My friend might be you know, across the bay at Stanford. Uh, one option, let's say you know, maybe it's the electronic state of some ion and I have the ion trapped, one option would be for me to take the lab that traps that ion uh, and to load it into the back of my car and to drive very carefully all the way around the bay and hope that the state of the ion isn't corrupted along the way. Uh, another option would be to try to, for example, measure the state of the ion, get on the phone, and communicate to somebody in a lab at, Stan at Stanford saying, prepare the following state. But as we've just seen, that doesn't work, right? That if you try to measure the state of an unknown quantum system, you damage it. So you might have thought that measurements were totally useless for uh, sending quantum information, but they're not. So, uh, and in particular, if I happen to share entanglement, you know, here at Berkeley, so if I had a bell pair, uh, a pair of ma maximally entangled qubits, one half here, the other half at Stanford, there is a way for me to perform a joint measurement of the quantum system I'm trying to send and the half of the entanglement existing here at Berkeley, uh, and then get on the phone and then tell my friends at Stanford, uh, this is the outcome that occurred when I performed the measurement. Uh, and then based on the outcome of the measurement, they perform some rotation uh, of the polarization, say. And what will, is guaranteed to come out uh, is a copy of the original, right? And so in the absence of the ability to actually physically transmit quantum data, if I have entanglement, that entanglement can substitute for the physical transmission. I can actually send quantum information 
using entanglement and classical uh, you know, talking on the phone. So if I wanted to communicate uh, quantum information over long distances, uh, what would I do? So the other, you know, not long ago, I was flying from San Francisco up to, uh, up to Calgary, uh, and we followed, uh, you know, I was marveling at the windows. It was a beautiful, clear day. I kept on seeing these enormous you know, volcanoes you know, in a string, one after the other. Um, and you might imagine, uh, you know, just for the purposes of illustration, that this quantum state, or this quantum system whose state I want to transmit, is at the summit of what mountain is that? Mount, well, I put on the top of Mount St. Helens. That's a bad choice, since Mount St. Helens doesn't have a summit anymore. Um, but uh, let's say it's at the summit of Mount St. Helens. And if I shared a bell pair uh, with somebody at the top of Mount Rainier, I could teleport that quantum information to Mount Rainier. But suppose I wanted to get the quantum information at the top of Glacier Peak, which is further north, right? If I happen to have bell pairs between Mount St. Helens and Rainier and Rainier and Glacier Peak, I could perform teleportation twice, right? And get the quantum state all the way up to Glacier Peak. Alternatively, I could use teleportation to move the half of the bell pair uh, between Mount St. Helens and Rainier up to Glacier Peak, establishing a bell pair over a longer distance, right? That's sort of just doing the same procedure in, you know, in the reverse order. And now that I have entanglement over a longer distance, uh, over a distance that I previously was unable to establish entanglement because of loss, then I could just teleport directly uh, from Mount St. or what, what am I here? Mount St. Helens up to Glacier Peak. And you might think that you haven't gained anything by doing this, but you actually do in practice. And the reason uh, is that um, when you establish entanglement and perform these teleportations, there's always a probability of failure. So let's say you only succeed 90% of the time. Uh, if you did this twice, or if you teleported your quantum information first to the top of Rainier and then to the top of Glacier Peak, you would tele you'd send your quantum information through two teleportations, and your probability of success would just be 0.9 squared. Right? And the more hops you take, uh, or if you take n hops, the probability of fa failure uh, goes to zero exponentially with the number of hops. Uh, and so you're risking your quantum state at every step. But if you establish the entanglement over long distances, you can just risk the bell pairs that you're teleporting. And when, you're actually, and when you actually succeed, uh, then you actually teleport your precious quantum information, and you only have to send it through one teleportation, and it's going to work 90% of the time. So you gain something by doing this. Uh, and as you can expect, or I guess I, didn't, uh, I might have got a bit ahead of myself, if we had bell pairs then between Mount Hood and Mount St. Helens and Glacier Peak and Mount Baker, we could use more teleportations to establish entanglement over longer and longer distances. Uh, we could ultimately hierarchically establish entanglement, say, from Northern California, where we live now, all the way up to the Canadian border. And this might sound fanciful, but this is the kind of thing that people are planning on doing in the next few years. Particular with, particularly, you may have heard about the, uh, the loophole-free Bell inequality experiment that was done by the DELF group um, using nitrogen vacancy centers um, just last fall. Um, they, are, uh, they are able to establish entanglement over long distances and perform me the measurements required for teleportation. The next step in their program is to start building uh, repeater networks like this to send entanglement over long distances. Now, OK, so that's a long distance entanglement. What does this have to do with quantum gravity? Well, we're not there yet, but let's think about a more complicated situation. So the volcanoes of the, of the Pacific Northwest are arrayed pretty much in a line, right? But let's think about a different situation. Here I've drawn the rail network of the United Kingdom, uh, which is much more of an interconnected thing. It's not a straight line. Um, and here is London, and there is Liverpool. Uh, and maybe, you know, in this fanciful future that we might all inhabit, you would like to establish long-distance entanglement between London and Liverpool. And you could imagine uh, that you have a bell pair, a pair of maximally entangled qubits, between every pair of stops on the UK rail network, right? Uh, and in that case, it's pretty clear what you'd have to do if you want to establish entanglement between London and Liverpool. You find a path through the rail network that goes from London to Liverpool, and you do a bunch of teleportations. Right? And if you want to establish more entanglement between London and Liverpool, you'd have to find another path that doesn't share any rail links with the first one, right? an edge dis disjoint path. So maybe there's a path down this way, there's another path that way, there's another path that way. And the number of bell pairs you can establish between London and Liverpool uh, is going to be determined by the number of edge disjoint paths you can find through the graph. Uh, that is otherwise known mathematically as the maximum flow through that graph. Uh, and it's a famous 
you know, excellent theorem of mathematics that the maximum flow through a graph is equal to the minimum cut. So what is the minimum cut? Well, for a planar graph like this, basically you just have to cut the graph, right? Uh, but with, the, with Liverpool on one side, London on the other side, in such a way that you cut as few edges as possible. But it's important to remember abstractly that a cut is, you know, and a cut is just defined more abstractly than that. What it is, uh, for each stop on the network, I should assign it either to London or to Liverpool or to London, right? Uh, so that I partition all stops between, you know, to a, a, you know, half of them or some of them to a London side, the other half to a Liverpool side, and then just count the number of edges going between them. So the notion of a cut is defined before you actually have some geometry like this. So what does this have to do with uh, the ADSCT correspondence, these random tensor networks I was telling you about before? Uh, well, the kind of tensor network that we were using to uh, construct something like the boundary state in ADSCFT, how did we make it? Well, we started off with a bunch of bell pairs, right? Arrayed in a network, very much like the UK rail network picture that I showed you on the previous slide. And then what we did to them uh, is we applied some random projections uh, to the bulk vertices. That doesn't sound a lot like what I was telling you to do on the previous slide. On the previous slide, to establish Lond entanglement between London and Liverpool, you found a path from London to Liverpool, you did a bunch of teleportations. And then you found another path from London to Liverpool that you didn't use up the first time, and then you do a bunch of teleportations. Here, you don't bother finding any paths, you just do random measurements, random projections at all internal sites in the network that don't include London and Liverpool. Uh, and it's a, now a theorem of quantum information that this procedure, where you don't bother finding the paths, but you just do random measurements, actually establishes exactly, you know, precisely as much entanglement as the more constructive procedure that I described previously. And so if you wanted to establish as much entanglement as you could between any two points in this network, uh, you can do it by just doing the random measurements, doing exactly the same thing uh, as we did to construct the boundary state. And so the mathematics of entanglement repeater networks is pretty much the same mathematics as these toy models of ADS-CFT. But it goes further than that, uh, which is that once these types of networks uh, uh, of entanglement were, were proposed, quantum information theorists said, well, let's study this problem in its full generality. So let's not think about, about networks of bell pairs, let's just think about completely arbitrary quantum states. And what they found is that for completely arbitrary quantum states, if you ask what is the maximum entanglement you can produce between an A part and a B part of the network with the assistance of the internal nodes, where assistant made at the internal nodes, you might perform some measurements and report results, but you can't do any quantum communication. They found that for arbitrary quantum states, an appropriate notion of thermodynamic limit, the answer you get is the min cut. And so that's what this is here. It's, it's a notion of min cut. It doesn't matter what the details is. And so the answer you get is the Ryu Takianagi formula, but before you even have to propose that there's any geometry associated to the quantum state. And so I guess uh, one year before Ryu Takianagi proposed this. Uh, uh, formula for semi-classical quantum gravity, some version of it was already discovered in the quantum information li literature uh, that might be viewed as the fully quantum version of Ryu Takianagi. Uh, and so what are the morals here? Well, it turns out this tensor network picture that I was describing uh, as the toy model of ADS-CFT is is isn't actually necessary, uh, that you can do the same thing with any semi-classical quantum gravity state that has an area law. And as I said, there's sort of a fully quantum version that was pre-existing in the quantum information literature before uh, its semi-classical version was found uh, in quantum gravity. So now I'm going to move on to another part of the correspondence. I, I guess, like, for me, uh, I just find it delightful uh, that this problem that, that I, I, I was interested in uh, for a purely quantum information theoretic reason, so really kind of practical reasons, turns out uh, to have direct bearing on this much more uh, fun, you know, of this problem of fundamental physics. Um, now on to uh, another problem in ADS-CFT. So I mentioned before that one of the questions that everybody wants to know the answer to uh, is what, are the, what is the relationship between observables, questions you can ask, physical questions on the boundary theory, uh, and physical questions in the bulk theory. Uh, and this is really the question, you know, like there's supposed to be an isomorphism between these two theories, what are the elements of the dictionary? Uh, 
And if you want to write down a boundary observable in terms of bulk observables, it turns out that's an easy, you know, a pretty easy thing to do. Uh, so if I have an observable, which is uh, you know, some question that I ask uh, about some local properties of the bulk. So for example, I might ask, at this point of the bulk, at some particular point of time, is that the interior of a star? Or is it a sunny day? Or whatever, right? There's an observable. Uh, so if I then take the position of that observable, so, or I'm asking the question, the question of particular position, uh, I can then move the observable out towards the boundary. Uh, as I go out towards the boundary, uh, I should get an observable which is localized to the boundary. And up to some rescaling to make things finite, that's exactly what happens. So if you want to write boundary observables in terms of bulk quantities, uh, this is actually a pretty straightforward thing to do. Going in the opposite direction uh, is much more complicated. Uh, but this is the kind of question uh, that we, you know, where there are a lot of questions, well, where we'd really like to know the answer. That uh, Raphael alluded to the firewall problem uh, earlier you know, in the introduction. That's really the question, if you fall into a black hole, when you cross the horizon, what do you experience? Is it, you know, for a large black hole, do you experience nothing special, which is what Einstein's, you know, general theory of relativity would predict? Or do you get cooked because of some crazy quantum gravity effect? And at this point, we don't know the answer to that question, but it should be encoded into the, you know, into the structure of ADS-CFT. Uh, if we could properly describe bulk observables in terms of boundary data in a, uh, in a way that we could actually compute. Uh, so back in 2006, Hamilton, Kabat, Lifshitz, and Lowe came up with a prescription for doing this, uh, some circum or, uh, came up with a prescription for doing this. And the details don't matter too much, uh, but the idea is that if you want to describe a particular bulk observable, which is labeled by here, say, uh, in two plus one dimensions, a, an angular position and radial position, I'm suppressing the time, then you can write it as a superposition. So it's an integral, this is some number, so it's just a, a weighted superposition uh, of boundary observables. And those boundary observables depend on the angular coordinate, beta tilde, and some time. So that's actually a, uh, a little bit more complicated. Uh, if I want to describe this bulk observable, I have to write it as a linear combination of boundary observables at different positions and different times. So what does it mean to be different times? That's the Heisenberg picture of quantum mechanics, right? I just observe, move the observable to different times. Now, the details of how you figure out what this smearing function is don't really matter to us, uh, but there is a, um, a qualitative conclusion that does come out of it that does really, really matter to us a lot, which is that uh, we don't always actually need the entire boundary to describe a given bulk observable, right? And that should actually make some sense. Like, we look at the top picture, if we take a bulk observable and move it closer and closer and closer to the boundary, uh, we, get, we ultimately get a boundary localized observable, right? And so in some sense, if you have a boundary observable, uh, or if you have an observable which is close to the boundary, you should only use, need a part of the boundary that's nearby to describe it intuitively. Uh, and this is, their theorem actually implies this. Uh, and it leads to a conceptual puzzle about ADS-CFT that I'd like to describe to you. Uh, so here's the puzzle. I take a region of the boundary, the red part here, uh, and there's a, a bulk region called the causal wedge associated to that red boundary region. And the details of its definition don't matter to us, okay? Uh, in empty ADS, it turns out that this, uh, this causal wedge, the way that you find it is you calculate the geodesic between the two endpoints of the interval, and everything inside the geodesic, uh, that's, that's, the, that's the causal wedge. Uh, and then the... Uh, a consequence of this HKLL prescription is that any observable inside the causal wedge can be described entirely in terms of observables uh, in the red region on the boundary, right? And so that's the, that's the message. In ADS-CFT, uh, if you want to ask a question about the bulk and you ask what part of the boundary encodes you know, the answer, uh, in general, it's only part of the boundary and it's the part drawn right there. Uh, but that leads to a question. So now let's expand the boundary region A, like I've drawn right here, uh, and then I have A complement, uh, and I put a bulk observable deep inside ADS right there in the middle. Uh, and because this bulk observable is inside the causal wedge, uh, I only need A to describe, uh, or I can describe this bulk observable in terms of boundary stuff using only uh, uh, observables that act on A. And that means that my bulk or boundary observable 
that is equivalent to phi 2 under this isomorphism uh, shouldn't do anything interesting on a complement, right? I don't need a complement uh, in order to just, you know, reproduce the physics of phi 2. And so as an observable mathematically, it means my observable should act trivially on a complement, right? Like if I, uh, if I have a measurement, um, and let's say that I'm going to measure, you know, uh, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to look at this little corner of the table right here uh, and look at what color it's, it is, and it's black. Uh, the observable, uh, I can write an observable in terms of the entire table, but it's going to act as the identity everywhere except for the place that I'm looking, right? So here, it, the observable associated with phi 2 on the boundary should be the identity on a complement. But then I can fix my observable and rotate the, you know, what's called the region A around the boundary. And if I rotate it, then the first A complement, um, on, on the first A complement, my observable is trivial. On the second one, when I rotate it a bit, it's still trivial. When I, and as I keep on rotating, it's trivial, 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 trivial. And the conclusion seems to be that the correct observable on the boundary to write down for phi 2 is the identity operator. So an observable that gives me no information when I measure it. But that's a contradiction, because this observable is supposed to be able to be the answer to some physical question, right? Maybe, the, again, the question might be something like, uh, is it a sunny day at this point uh, in uh, anti de Sitter space? Um, and whether it's a sunny day or not is going to depend on the state. It's not a trivial observable. So this looks like a contradiction. And we scratch, you know, people scratch their heads and look and say, well, what's going on? Uh, and Almeri, Dong, and Harlow looked at this puzzle uh, last year uh, and, and noticed that the answer to this puzzle is that what's going on is that ADS-CFT is an elaborate quantum error correcting code. So what does that mean? Uh, let's talk about what quantum error correcting codes are. Um, so quantum error correcting codes were developed uh, in, order to be able to, in order to protect quantum computers from the effects of noise, right? Uh, and so you want to be able to encode quantum mechanical degrees of freedom uh, in you know, sort of logical degrees of freedom into physical qubits or other systems such that corruption of your physical qubits doesn't uh, irreparably damage your quantum state. And here's an example. I can encode a spin one or the unknown state of a spin one particle or, uh, into three spin one particles. So I might have the uh, unknown spin right here and I could have two other spin one particles with the Z projection zero. If I evolve them with the right, just the right Hamiltonian for just the amount, right amount of time, I'll get out a quantum state psi, and that quantum state depends on the input state, but my Hamiltonian and my time do not. And this output state is going to have a very remarkable uh, property, which is that I can lose any one of the three spin one particles and still reconstruct the original quantum information. So in practice, what does that mean? It means that uh, if I only received uh, spin one, you know, the first spin one and the second spin one, there is an apparatus that would take as input those two spin ones. You know, it would whir and buzz and flash and do whatever it does, and out would come a single spin one particle, and the state of that spin one particle would be phi. Whereas if I only received one and three, there'd be some different apparatus, and if I, I send Q, uh, you know, the spins one and three into that different apparatus, it would then whir and spin and shine and do whatever it does, and out comes, again, a single spin one particle in state phi. So I can recover the, from the loss of any one of my three uh, particles. Uh, and if you care to know what you know, this particular code looks like, it's, you know, this is it. It's a unitary transformation, but the details don't matter. Now, think about what's going on here, right? Uh, I had some quantum information, and I encoded it into three systems. And I can lose any one system and still recover the information, right? So uh, this, situa so the situation is very much like what we just saw in the ADS-CFT correspondence, right? That I, I saw in, in ADS-CFT there was this region A complement. And I didn't need A complement in order to recover the quantum information. But A complement, the union of all my A complements was a whole system. So I drew this conclusion that the observable had to be trivial. I don't, need Q, uh, I don't need the first spin to recover my information because I can recover it from two and three. I don't need the second one because I can recover it from one and three. I don't need the third one because I can recover from one and two. But that doesn't mean that the, uh, the encoding is trivial. It does mean that for it to work, I have to have an error correcting code. And so the resolution of this puzzle uh, was that uh, the ADS-CFT correspondence, it doesn't work for all states. 
uh, if you have a given background geometry, uh, you can think about observables uh, with the, uh, such that when you act with those observables on the states, uh, you only actually uh, mildly affect the state in such a way that the, the background geometry doesn't work or doesn't change. Uh, and that set of states forms a subspace, and that subspace is a quantum error correcting code. And this isn't just language. Um, you know, there's not time for me to go into the details. But once this observation, this connection between quantum error correction and ADS-CFT was made, uh, in the setting of these random tensors, uh, my collaborators and I were able to study that and see that it was possible, at least in that toy model, to reconstruct the bulk much, much deeper uh, than the HKLL prescription uh, made it look like it would be possible. Uh, and so in, in the game of ADS-CFT, we want to be able to go as deep into the bulk as possible because ultimately we want to know what happens if you fall into a black hole and other questions like that. Uh, and the observation that quantum error correction is at work turns out to be very helpful for that. And subsequently, Dong, Harlow, and Wall have, been, have made an argument that this, the same should be true in ADS-CFT itself. That we should be able to go deeper than the HKLL prescription. So what are the lessons uh, of this uh, past hour or so, 50 minutes? I mean, the first one is that entanglement encodes the structure uh, of at least space in ADS-CFT. Uh, and we have to understand exactly how time comes in. Uh, there is more to the story than what I told you. Uh, there are caveats and so on and so forth, but it is, it is clearly true that the mathematics of entanglement, repeater networks, in some form is related closely to the mathematics of ADS-CFT. Uh, we've also learned that the holographic correspondence, this thing that was seen quite mysterious, how does the hologram encode you know, the, the bulk geometry? It encodes it as a quantum error correcting code. This is an important conceptual advance that should have uh, computational uh, consequences in the near future. Now, everything I've told you so far has kind of been static. It's a property of states. And in physics, we care about dynamics, right? We care about time. Uh, and so this is not something I did. This is work by Lashkari and others. But I just want to point out uh, that quantum information theory ideas can also help you recover the dynamics of space-time. Uh, and they've done some work recently where if they take the Ryutakinami formula, and they combine that with quantum information properties of the boundary theory, they're actually able to derive Einstein's equations to linear order. And so the dynamics of, uh, of space and time are also intimately related to entanglement. My last words here, um, 25 years ago, uh, John Wheeler, uh, whom I'm sure many of you know, uh, a giant of 20th century physics, Feynman's supervisor, the man who coined the term black hole, among many other uh, important contributions, uh, kind of raised a, a, uh, coined a three-syllable manifesto uh, for what he thought was going to be necessary in order to properly unify quantum mechanics and gravity. And his manifesto was it from bit. And he said that it from bit symbolizes the idea that every item of the physical world has at bottom, a very deep bottom in most instances, an immaterial source and explanation. That which we call rea reality arises in the last analysis from the posing of yes or no questions and the registering of equipment to vote responses. In short, that all things physical are information theoretic in origin, and this is a participatory universe. Uh, and that was a, a kind of call to arms. Um, now, unfortunately, this did not really come to fruition during, uh, during Wheeler's lifetime. I think that we're actually making rapid progress on his vision now, uh, but it's important to, uh, to look backwards uh, and note that while he didn't during his lifetime, or this vision did not really succeed at resolving the problems of quantum gra gravity then, it did inspire a generation of young people to ask very interesting questions. And so a postdoc at the University of Texas uh, in Wheeler's orbit named David Deutsch pretty much invented the field of quantum computation. Uh, an undergraduate at the University of Texas who hung around that group as a graduate student uh, worked at the theory of quantum compression, coined the term qubit. Uh, and one of Wheeler's graduate students, Bill Wooders, is the guy who figured out teleportation. And so Wheeler's charismatic vision was one of the major driving forces behind the establishment of quantum information as a field. And now I think we're finally seeing uh, his original motivation being vindicated. And so if you find this kind of thing interesting, especially the students and the postdocs around, we're going to run a summer school at the Perimeter Institute uh, this, this summer. Uh, so I encourage you to get online and to, to register for the summer school, because I think the deadline for registration is upon us, pretty much. Um, but that's what I wanted to share with you, and thank you very much for your attention.